today. And all the people said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. Well, the title of the message today is Winning the War in Your Mind. And I'd like you to turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 10. And um, this scripture is the foundation for everything we're going to be looking at today. And it's a, a very important uh, message. I believe it will speak to you. I believe it will destroy maybe some um, misconceptions you have had. Uh, hopefully it will clarify some things for you. But it says in 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 3, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing, into, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So it's interesting to hear the Bible acknowledges that we are in a war, and um, it acknowledges the fact that, that as a Christian, you are in a war, but it says the weapons of warfare are not carnal, they're not physical, they're not guns or grenades or, or bombs or tanks, um, but it says that they are mighty for pulling down strongholds. And in many instances, those strongholds exist in your mind. And that's why it, it further addresses, it says, casting down arguments and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ. So it's interesting, it goes into the realm of thoughts. And, um, you know, the Bible acknowledges that all of us are in a war. Whether you realize it or not, there is a battle for your brain. And you see, this is the thing. Hell, if it cannot have your heart... It will settle for your head. Amen? Because again, if you're born again, hell can't have your heart. But it, hell can still have your head. You can be born again, praying in tongues, washed in the blood, and yet hell has a grip on your head. And this is why this message is very, very important to you. Because there is a literal war on your mind. You know, many of you are under assault even right now. You look good. You got your hair done. You're wearing your Sunday best. But inside, you're hanging on for dear life. Your life has become a roller coaster of toxic thoughts and emotions. And you're fighting a losing battle to maintain a semblance of control. You see, many of you are in a battle right now. A battle maybe for your marriage or for your family or some of you are actually battling for your own sanity. You see, Satan wants to take you out. And what you do with your mind will, in a very large part, determine whether or not he is successful in his plan to destroy you and your family. And this is the thing. Because it's an invisible war, sometimes we are not as aware of it as we should. Because while it can't be seen, it sure can be felt. And this is a war, like I said, it can't be seen with our eyes. But again, it's real nonetheless. You know, this is the thing. All of us struggle in our minds. You know, hopelessness, despair, and negativity. These are all hallmarks of a society under siege. We're living right now in a society that is under siege. You know, many times we come under attack in the arena of our mind and we don't even realize it. Amen. You're sitting there with your Bible in your hand. You say amen at the right time. But you can't even think straight because your mind is literally being bombarded with thoughts even as you're sitting there. Your soul is under siege. Under siege from the voices that only you can hear in your head. Nobody else hears those voices, but you do. Those voices that say to you things like, you're going to lose everything. Your marriage is not going to make it. You're going to die young, just like your father. Your kids will never come back to God. You're never going to get out of debt. You're never going to find love. You're, you're never going to own your own home. You know, voices that, that say things like that, say things like, it's not going to happen for you. You're never going to find true love. You might as well give up. You know the consultant said you've only six months left to live. The bank are going to foreclose and there's nothing you can do about it. You see, none of us are exempt from, from this battle. The battle in our brain. 
And, and again, you may respond by saying, well, I, I just thought I was down. That's just the way I am. I'm Irish, so I'm, I'm naturally negative. <laughs> I have a tendency towards being negative. Well, I'm just honest. I'm just pragmatic. I just like to say it as it is. Or, or I, I'm just a warrior. No, you're a warrior. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 3 says, Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. You see, the soul is the arena. One in which many battles are fought. And unfortunately, one in which many are lost with terrible consequences for the persons involved. You know, even though we are a relatively affluent society in Ireland... You know, we have a literal epidemic of suicide, particularly among young men in this nation. And even though we don't ever really like to talk about it, it's a very real issue for many families. I know that coming from Southern Ireland, there's parts of the country where there, where there, there are roads where there isn't one home that hasn't been touched by suicide. And I think that's absolutely tragic. And you know, it's not that people want to die, but sadly for some, they can no longer find a reason to live. And, and I sometimes wonder how many of these precious people filled, you know, with so much potential and an ability, you know, they tragically ended their lives long before their time, simply because they were ignorant of the fact that they were in a battle. Hosea 4 verse 6 says, my people are destroyed through lack of knowledge. You know, they were ignorant of the fact that their mind was under attack. Their soul was under siege. And they were ignorant of the fact that the voice that was whispering into their ears was not that of their own mind. Rather, it was that of the enemy of their soul, Satan. And John 10.10 10 says, he only comes to rob, to kill, and to destroy. Remember that when the enemy whispers in your ear. He has only one agenda, and that is to destroy your life. He, he, the Bible says he is a liar and the father of lies in John 8 verse 44. You belong to your father, the devil, and you want to carry out your father's desires. He was a murderer from the beginning, not holding to the truth, for there is no truth in him. When he lies, he speaks his native language, for he is a liar and the father of lies. You see, Satan is the source of this mental assault. Because Satan wants to control your life by controlling your thoughts. Remember that. If he can control your thoughts, he can control your actions. He can control your destiny. Amen. So this is the tragedy for many people. People that God loves so dearly. People that he paid such a price for at the cross. And yet they believe a lie. And therefore their lives get so out of control. The pain gets so extreme that they surrender their soul to a foreign power. Be that addiction, confusion, condemnation, you know, lust, anger, abuse, or even suicide. The casualties of this war are, are, are all around us. Whether in the church or outside the church. I mean, if we can open our eyes, we can see that. You know, broken homes, broken lives, broken, hurting people. Who, who, you know, they no longer, they no longer live or, 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 or laugh or love. They just simply exist. And, and I think this is tragedy. This, you, you know, that so many people just learn to accept their chains. And surrender to a life of slavery. You know, bitterness, disillusionment and cynicism take re residence in their soul. And, and, and from then on, they, 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 they learn to accommodate themselves to these chains rather than believing to see those things broken over their lives. You know, discouraged and disappointed in life, they just give up. They give up on their dreams and their ambitions and simply try to get through the day by, by self-medicating the pain. Tablets to get up and tablets to go to bed. And I believe this is so tragic. You know, surely we were made for more than this. Surely we were made for more than this. I, I love this quote by Rick Warren. The greatest tragedy is not death, but life without purpose. And this is why I want us to turn to Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Again here, Ephesians acknowledges the fact that we're in a battle. It says a final word. 
Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on God's piece of armor. Uh, <clears throat> Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then after the battle, you will still be standing firm. Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. For shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you'll be fully prepared. In addition to all these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery darts, uh, arrows of the, of the devil. Put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Uh, it's interesting, addresses the helmet which covers your head. But here, you know, Ephesians 6 clearly acknowledges that we are in a battle. And, and it also shows that while the source of this demonic attack against our lives is always spiritual in nature, I believe it also acknowledges the fact that the gateway in many instances to these spiritual attacks comes through the mind. Amen? So, you know, it's the mind, you know, that these oppressive, occupying powers enter into your lives. Many instances, it is through the realm of the soul. When the Bible refers to the soul, it refers to your, your mind, your will, your emotions. So again, your mind is important. And I appreciate this as a Pentecostal church. You know, we pray in tongues and that's wonderful. But sometimes um, we focus so much on the spiritual that we neglect the soul. And, and the, your mind matters. I think it's important to understand that. Amen? So, uh, again, remember, Satan only comes with one purpose in mind, to rob, to kill, to destroy. And this is the sad thing. Like I said, sometimes in church, we, we tend to focus and emphasize the spirit so much that we neglect the arena of the soul. And uh, I, I could follow on by saying the body, it's important. Look after your body as well, but I, I know that wouldn't go over well in a spiritual church. Um, everything is sin except for eating fried chicken. Uh, so let's not go there. Let's, let's just deal with one at a time. Um, but you are a spirit, a soul, and a body. This is the important thing. This, there's more to you than just the material. Because if that was the case, when you lie, when, when you die, the cessation of life would be the cessation of your existence. But we know that reading the Bible, that is not the case. Amen. Um, uh, 1 Thessalonians 5.23 says, I pray God your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved. You must look after all three parts of your being. Amen. That's why balance isn't a bad word. Therefore, we must not neglect the soul um, if we want to walk in victory. But you know, is, are there any secrets to, to, to win the battles that we face? Is there any solution to our struggle? You know, today we're going to study what the Bible has to say about winning the war that exists in and on your mind. Fact is, I took a lot of time thinking about, you know, for the title, should I say winning the war in your mind or winning the war on your mind? And the reality is I could have used either because there's a, a war in your mind. There's also a war on your mind. Amen. So anyway, um, this is the thing. The, 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 the God who created your mind also holds the secret to a life filled with joy and a mind that is at perfect peace no matter what is going on or what is going wrong around you. Isaiah 26, 3. Him will you keep in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So if you want to walk on pe in peace, your mind is absolutely crucial. So today, let's look at some keys to winning the war on your mind. And the first one is this, your faith. Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Hebrews 11 6, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. It doesn't say difficult, it's impossible. Romans 10 and verse 17, Now faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of God. You know, sadly, even though we have so much information and education and technology and opportunity, in many respects, faith is the factor that is overlooked by our generation. And again, our generation is facing a literal epidemic of mental illness. But you know, in many instances, the only solution that the medical profession has is to medicate it. 
but they're not actually dealing with the core issue. You know, and I think this is important to, be, to, to understand. T to be victorious, we must deal with the cause and not just the symptoms. And, you know, firstly, let me clarify. I believe that God is a healer. And he doesn't care how you get healed. Whether through medicine or through prayer, or through prayer it's all from him. Okay, so you don't stop taking your medicine just because you believe it might not be in faith. Let me repeat, God wants you well and he doesn't care how we receive it. Amen. So it, it all comes from him. I absolutely believe that he uses doctors to heal just as he uses faith and prayer. And in many instances, he will work through both. Amen? Because ultimately, all healing is from heaven. How many of you believe that? How many of you believe God's a healer? I think it's important. You know, ultimately, all healing is from heaven. All healing is divine in its source. Because Exodus 15, 26 says, He said to you, if you listen carefully to the Lord your God and do what is right in His eyes, if you pay attention to His commands and keep all His decrees, I will not bring on you any of the diseases I brought on the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. Another version says, I am the Lord, your healer. So we must understand that God has revealed himself as a healer. He wants you well. Amen? And, um, and this healing that, that we see in Exodus is not just, you know, healing of your mind or, you know, your body. It's, 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 healing of every part of your being and therefore we have to understand it doesn't just apply to physical healing it also the, the realm of the soul which is relevant now Matthew chapter 4 and verse 23 then Jesus went about all Galilee teaching their synagogues preaching the gospel of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people then his fame went throughout all Syria. They brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon-possessed and epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. And um, again, in Ephesians, uh, sorry, Matthew chapter 8, and he touched her hand and the fever left her and she rose and served them. When evening had come, they brought to many who were demon possessed, and he cast out the spirits of the word and healed all who were sick, that it might be fulfilled what was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, He himself took on infirmities, bore our sicknesses. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all, every sickness and every disease among the people. Every sickness, every disease. Christ is a healer. Amen? It's important. And that's why Acts chapter 8, 10, 38, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power who went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil. Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus Christ the same. So the, the ministry of Christ, in order to be the same, he still has to be healing today just as he did 2,000 years ago. Amen. Jesus Christ is a healer. So I think it's important for us to understand that healing was an absolutely integral part of the ministry of Jesus Christ. And is still, you know, a core teaching within the body of Christ today. And you see, this is the thing. Our faith is absolutely integral to our mental and physical wholeness as well as our spiritual well-being. It's like somebody I know recently told me, she tells all of her non-Christian friends, you should read the Bible, it's great for your mental health. And she's right, it is. The Bible is great for your mental health, amen? And, um, you know, and, and this is the reality is, many times we're struggling because we haven't been reading the Word of God, amen? So, you know, it's interesting that mental issues and all of the sicknesses and, and social, you know, problems that are associated with it have been increasing in direct proportion to our society's rejection of faith in God and ignorance of, of, this, of the moral truths as taught in the Bible, you know, uh, U.S. President Ronald Reagan said this, Within the covers of the Bible are the answers to all of the problems that men face. Do you believe that? Then why are you not reading it more? I'm just saying, if we believe this book contains the answers, why do we so many times just, you know, veg out in front of a TV for hours and we can go for days, if not weeks on end, without opening this book and saying, Lord, speak to me. Okay? This is not about condemnation or legalism. Uh, amen? Your husband hasn't told me about you or your wife. I'm just, I'm just flowing in the Spirit right now. Glory to God. 
But anyway, again, I think it's a beautiful quote. Within the covers of the Bible are the answers for all the problems men face. Praise God for, for political leaders who are not ashamed of Jesus Christ. Amen? Anyway, contrary to what many, you know, atheists and liberals uh, claim, matters of, of the heart and matters of the mind are irrevocably linked. Amen? They are, they are linked together. The matters of the heart, matters of the mind. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone, but on every word that comes from the mouth of God. So exactly what are you feeding on? Are you feeding on hours and hours of TV or hours of social media or hours of, of news, etc., bad news? Or are you feeding on the Word of God? Jesus said, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Lester Summerall had a great phrase, feed your faith and starve your doubts. Amen? And this is what we must do. We must feed our faith because we are in a war. That's why Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, Therefore, um, brethren, don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may approve what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. So again, if you want to be transformed, if you want your life to be transformed, the answer is found within the covers of this book. Amen? So if you want to win this war, you must renew your mind. You know, Ephesians 4 verse 23, God commands us to be renewed in the spirit of our minds. You see, the only thing that has the power to transform and change the way we think is God's eternal word. If he, uh, Hebrews 4.12, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul, spirit, joints, and barrel, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. So when you are reading this book, you are dealing with a living thing. You see, first you read the Bible, and then the Bible reads you. How many of you know, you, you can't read this for too long before you start repenting and saying, oh, okay, Lord, I need to change here. Forgive me. Okay, Lord, help me to realign my life here, because it will speak to you. How important is your faith to you? Your faith is not important to you if your Bible is not important to you. I remember when I was a youth pastor preparing my, my, my sermons 15, 16 years ago, I didn't have a computer, so I used to do it in church. And interestingly, there was a, a, a computer right next to the lost and found. And it was a big box. You know what it was full of? I never once saw a wallet in there. I never once saw car keys or home keys in there. You know what that box was full of? Bibles. 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 Yeah. I think that's very sad. Yeah. Amen. We must be people of the word. How important is your faith to you? If your faith is important to you, the Word of God will be important to you. That's why you need to get into Bible school and stick with it. Don't be one of these every, you know, we have so many people that have started and quit. The devil will always give you a reason to quit Bible school. You need to come in, stick with it. Be a person who sticks with the Word of God. Amen. Don't be a starter, be a finisher in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, we're living in a time when so many people have a faith that seems to be irrelevant to how they live their lives. You know, I thought it was rather ironic. Um, recently, there was a Catholic couple recently in the news. They were pro-choice activists who complained that the priest refused to marry them. I thought it was ironic that they were portraying themselves as victims. And ultimately, the real victim in the case are the unborn babies that will die as a result of what they were doing. You know, may I simply suggest this? If you're a pro-choice activist, that you do not understand the core tenets of the Christian faith. And maybe a different faith would suit you. Because you cannot worship the God of life and yet reject the very life that that God gives. Amen. Nothing has changed since the referendum. Abortion is still murder. And all those who consider themselves to be Christians will one day give an account to God for how they voted in that referendum. You see, even if everyone on the planet and their granny voted yes in the referendum, abortion would still be wrong because the veracity of biblical truth, the veracity of moral truth is not determined by its popularity. The veracity of moral truth is not determined by whether or not it's politically correct or by whether people embrace or celebrate it. It is truth because God declared it. 
And therefore, you can simply accept or reject it. It's simple as that. Matthew 24 and verse 35, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. The new living, heaven and earth will disappear, but my words will never disappear. Your faith. Secondly, your focus. Luke 6, 45, for out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. The NIV, a good man brings good things out of the good stored up in him. And an evil man brings evil things out of the evil stored up in his heart. For the mouth speaks what the heart is full of. Isn't that amazing? The NLV, what you say flows from what is in your heart. The Berean Bible, for out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. If you want to know what's on a person's mind, all you have to do is simply listen to them. Because what's in their heart will eventually come out of their mouth. Some people you realize within seconds, they're just full of negativity, unbelief, strife, bitterness, and anger. Because it comes out in the words they speak. All they can speak about... All they can speak about is what the devil said or what this person did to them or what that person said about them or why things won't work for them. And you know what I've discovered? It's almost impossible to get people like that healed because they don't listen. Amen. And Proverbs 18, 21, death and life are in the power of the tongue and they that love it shall eat the fruit thereof. You see, you can literally curse your life by the words you're speaking out of your mouth. This is why hell wants to control your thoughts because your words first begin as thoughts. And this is why you must refuse to think or talk negatively. Proverbs 24 and 23 and 7, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. Because as you see yourself, so shall you be, for good or for evil. Bruce Lee said this, what you habitually think largely determines what you will ultimately become. Isn't that a powerful quote? What you habitually think. And that should be rather sobering, considering, you know, for some of us, what we habitually think about. Because if we were to be honest, many of us, what we habitually think upon is more negative than positive. And, and therefore, Proverbs 23, 7, as he thinks in his heart, so is he. Can you see then why Satan fights so hard to control what we're thinking about? He wants to set the schedule. He wants you to focus on his thoughts, not on God's. He wants you to see yourself his way and not God's way. Pro Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. And it says, Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. So here the Bible tells us what to think about. Think on what's honest and what's pure and what's lovely and what's good report. Don't be meditating on the devil's bad report. You see, for many of us, it's time to change the channel. You know, Einstein said it's the height of insanity to keep doing the same thing and expect a different result. If we keep thinking the same way, we're going to keep getting the same results. And if you're not happy with where you are right now, maybe it's time to make an adjustment in your thinking. Amen. It's time to cut your subscription to the negativity channel. It's time to get rid of the poverty channel. Amen. The, the, the depression channel, the, the fear or, or failure channel. It's time for a new focus in your life. Napoleon Hill said this, Opportunity often comes disguised in the form of misfortune or temporary defeat. The Irish playwright Oscar Wilde, We're all in the gutter, but some of us are looking at the stars. You see, you can't always choose your circumstances, but you can always choose your focus. Like, I said, like Oscar Wilde, you may be flat on your back, but you know what? Look up at the stars. Dream of a better tomorrow. You know, dare to dream that God could do something in your life. Your focus is very important. We must fight to maintain a positive per attitude and perspective on our lives. Amen. Because ultimately, what you focus on is going to be what you hit. Where you focus will determine where you go. You see, sometimes in life you win 
And sometimes you learn. And you need to have that attitude. Don't be a person that gives in to despair just because things don't work out. Sometimes you win. Sometimes you learn. Good experience, bad experience. You can chalk it all down to experience. Amen? Hallelujah. So I think it's important to do that. You know, get up, dust yourself off, and go again in Jesus' name. I like this quote by Candace Owens. She said this, The motivation to succeed is what you give up when you commit to a victim mentality. You can't be a winner at life if you're a loser in your own head. It's an amazing young lady, but I think that's a tremendous quote. You can't be a winner in life if you're a loser in your own head. Is your mind focused on past failures, present struggles, or future possibilities? The choice is yours. You need to dare to dream. Or even better still, dare to believe. Mark 9, 23. If you can believe, all things are possible to those who believe. This is what Jesus said. Amen. So again, 2 Corinthians 1, 20. All the promises of God in Him are yes and in in Him. Amen. Focus on His promises and on your possibilities and not on your past or your problems. Psalm 23, 3, he restores my soul. You see, if you will focus on the shepherd, he will heal your soul. Refuse to be a victim in life. Amen? You can't always choose what happens, but you can choose to not be a victim in Jesus' name. Psalm 5, verse 1, give ear to my words, O Lord, consider my meditation. Give heed to the voice of my cry, my King and my God, for to you I will pray. My voice you will hear in the morning, O Lord. In the morning I will direct it to you, and I will look up. I will look up. You know, there was an old ad back in the 80s for Aer Lingus. Look up, it's Aer Lingus. Something we need to remind ourselves every day. Look up, your redemption draws nigh. Look up, hallelujah, heaven is your home. Look up, the best is yet to come. Look up, God's not finished with you yet. Come on, people, give a shout of praise. David said, I will lift up my eyes unto the hills. Where does my help come from? My help comes from the Lord, the maker of heaven and earth. How many of you believe that your help comes from the Lord? Come on, people. The Lord is your helper. You can't fail. You may go through some storms. You may get knocked down every now and then. But each time you get up and say, thank you, Lord. You are my helper. I can't fail. Your hand is on my life. I'm purchased with your blood. Heaven is my home. Jesus is my Lord. The best is yet to come. Glory to Jesus. The best is yet to come. And I will look up. David understood the secret of success. Focus on God. He says when the day starts, I'm going to look up. Hallelujah. Focus on God. You start your day with Him. You continue your day with Him. And you finish your day with Him. In Jesus name. Numbers 21.4. As they journeyed from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea. It says the soul of the people was much discouraged because of the way. You see, discouragement can get a grip on your mind. That's why you got to fight negativity. you got to fight discouragement. Don't let that thing get a, a grip. Because the Bible says because they were discouraged, snakes came in and started biting them. And again, if we give in to discouragement, we're opening the door to demonic oppression. Psalm 42, 5. David said, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise Him, my Savior and my God. David understood that he had a part to play if he wanted to walk in victory. 1 Samuel 30 verse 6 says, David encouraged himself in the Lord. In the midst of a discouraging situation, David encouraged himself. It's a choice, not a feeling. It's a choice, not an emotion. You can choose to encourage yourself in the Lord. You know what I find sometimes, I'm so, t- sometimes I, I push myself to the limit physically and, and I find myself repeating a mantra, I'm so tired, I'm so weary. And I, lately I've just started, no, in Jesus' name, I'm strong in the Lord, the power of His might, I'm not going to be speaking that. You know, sometimes instead of encouraging ourselves, we're discouraging ourselves, amen? No, you need to encourage yourself in the Lord. There will be times when you will have no one else around you to help you or to encourage you. And you need to be able to tap into a source that's not of this world. That's why David said, I will lift up my eyes onto the hills. 
He said, David understood his help didn't come from government or from his qualifications or from anybody else. He knew the source of his strength was the Lord, his God. Amen. And that's why 1 Samuel chapter 17 and verse 30, David said, Is there not a cause when Eliab, his brother, accused him? He said, Is there not a cause? And it says he turned from him. And this is a skill that every person needs to develop if you want to win the war in your mind. If you want to be a winner and not a loser, you got to know when to turn. you got to know when to turn and who to turn from. You see, David turned away from his brother. He had already learned the, 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 about the power of focus, even as a young boy. He realized that you can't listen to certain people if you want to fulfill your destiny. Amen? Certain, if you listen to some people, they will kill your dreams. It says he turned away. And you have to be able to do this. And this is why, just like Jesus, it's appropriate at times to turn away. Mark 5, 36 amplified. Overhearing, but ignoring what they said. Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, Do not be seized with alarm and struck with fear. Only keep on believing. You see, success in life is not just about what you focus on, but on what you choose to ignore. Amen. You must focus on the future and not on the past. Overhearing but ignoring. There are some things you won't be able to help overhearing, but you can choose to ignore. You can choose to ignore that voice in your head that says your marriage is over. You can choose to, to ignore that voice in your head that says you're going to die young like your father or, or whatever else the enemy is trying to say to you. You have to know when to turn from, from the voices that are not according to God's destiny for your life. Learn to ignore the voices that tell you you're too old. It, it, it won't happen. You know, listen, you can't, you can't win the war on your mind if you insist on listening to every voice and opinion. Numbers chapter 13. And verse 30, then Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up at once and take possession, for we are well able to overcome it. But the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go against the people, for we are, they are stronger than we. And they gave the children of Israel a bad report of the land which they had spied out, saying, the land through which we have gone as spies is a land that devours its inhabitants. All the people whom we saw in it are men of great stature. There we saw the giants. And we were like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so were we in their sight. According as you see yourself is how other people will see you. Can you see why Satan works so hard in your mind? To create an image on the inside of you. This is why your faith, your focus. You see, what they heard discouraged them. And who you listen to could be life or death. Let me say this as your pastor. I don't care how knowledgeable a preacher is about a certain subject. Or how well he talks or how well qualified. If he or she doesn't believe in the baptism of the Spirit and healing and miracles, it will hinder your faith. I, 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 you know, I love um, apologists and I love people who can intelligently articulate the gospel. The problem with listening to some of that is, is many of them mock the baptism of the Spirit. Many of them don't believe in miracles and healing. And therefore, you know, if you're listening to that stuff, it will kill your faith. It will kill it. Amen. So this is why it's important. Because there is so much available online. But you can end up destroying your faith. So don't be like a little, a little bird in a nest with its beak wide open for any worm that comes along. You have to be discerning about what you listen to. Because one bad seed can end up destroying your faith and shipwrecking your future. And again, this is another reason to come into Bible school. Study to show yourself approved. That you may know the word of God. The whole counsel of God. And that's my desire as a preacher. I don't just come and preach on one particular subject. I want to give you the whole counsel of God. Amen. So anyway, your faith, your focus. And lastly, your freedom. 2 Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, God has not given you a spirit of fear, but one of power, love, and a sound mind. God doesn't want you to have an unstable mind. He wants you to have a sound mind. That's his will for you. John 8, 36 if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. You see, God wants to set you free, but you can't walk in freedom as long as you are bound in your mind. 
2 Corinthians 3 and 17 in the Amplified. Now the Lord is the Spirit. And where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, emancipation from bondage, true freedom. You see, true freedom is only found in Jesus Christ. Amen. So God wants you to walk in freedom. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made you free, and be not entangled again with a yoke of bondage. And, and further on, he says, you ran well. Who hindered you? So you can start off well. It's Sunday with our school, uh, Friday with our school sports. And they had a father's race. But because it was so hot, um, I, 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 the guy was on the, the speaker. He didn't realize he was being overheard. He was saying to somebody, somebody could have cardiac arrest. So they decided instead of the 100 meter father's race, which uh, is usually very intense because men were very competitive, you know. Um, and we, we still like to think we have it going on, even in our, our middle age. And uh, so they decided to change it from a 100-meter sprint to a 25-meter sack race. I was like, that's so pathetic. Uh, but I couldn't resist it. So I said, okay, that's what the competition is. I'm getting in the sack, and I'm ready. And I'm just, I'm revving up. And I remember, uh, I just, the, 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 the thing went, and I just started, man, I just, I went out in front of everybody. I was flying. For about five feet. And then, I don't know what happened. I tripped over my feet or something. And I came down. But it was just very funny because my legs went out. And I knocked about four or five other guys. They fell down over me. <laughs> so it was, it was very humiliating. Um, I, really, I really felt I had it in me to win the sack race. But, but I tripped up. And that's the way a lot of Christians are. You, you start well, you, and you're so, you're so full of it, you're excited, but you trip over yourself, and before you know it, you're flat in your face. So here the Bible says, stand fast in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. Stay free. It's not enough to get free. Stay free in Jesus' name. God wants you to stay free. Maintain your freedom. Don't get caught up in legalism or religiosity. It's, so, it's funny. So many times we come out of religion and many Christians just end up going into another religion. It's just called Pentecostalism or, or evangelicalism or whatever else. But it's just religious. God doesn't want you. Jesus didn't come to give you religion. He said, I've come that you would have life. Amen. Glory to God. So again, it's not enough to get free. You must stay free. But ultimately, our freedom is found in Christ. That's why 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16, I want to read it here in the Amplified. And it says, do you not discern and understand? Sorry. For who has known or understood the mind, the counsel, and purposes of the Lord so as to guide and instruct him and give him knowledge? But we have the mind of Christ, the Messiah, and do hold the thoughts, feelings, and purposes of his heart. The Bible says that you have the mind of Christ. Amen. The mind of Christ isn't obsessed, depressed, deceived, distracted, or confused. So if you are any of those things, you don't have the mind of Christ in that area of your life. Amen. But, but, but Pastor John, this is my cross to bear. My sickness. My past. My husband. Let me, let me make it clear. Your husband is not your cross to bear. He may need some work. God's working on all of us. But it's not biblical. Jesus Christ is the only one that carried the cross. And he did enough. Amen. He did enough. Isaiah 55, 7. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord and he will have mercy on him. To our God he will abundantly pardon you see, clearly the Bible teaches that unrighteous acts originate from unrighteous thoughts. You know, it's obvious the unrighteous man is unrighteous because of the thoughts that he's indulged in and yielded to. And you see, that's why the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 55, it says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways. For as the heaven is high above the earth, so are my thoughts above your thoughts, my ways than your ways. This is why we come to the word of God because it is the higher way. Amen. It is the higher wisdom. Amen. It's not from th this world. It's the higher law. It's the narrow path that Jesus spoke about. You see, God's words contain God's thoughts. And so if you want to learn to think like God, you must read the Bible for yourself. Take time to become acquainted with how he thinks and your life will change forever.
You see, you will, you will discover a joy and a freedom that's not from this world. It's from heaven. Philippians 4, 7. And let the peace of God guard your heart and mind. You see, there will be a battle in these uncertain days to have that peace. Let the peace of God guard your heart and mind. But it will be a battle to walk in it. Particularly because of what I call the Me Too mentality. You know, my opinion, that whole movement is not about respect, progress, healing, or equality, but rather control. Because, you know, for years, Hollywood mocked and subverted family values. For years, they glamorized, you know, betrayal, perversion, and violence. But suddenly, they become the moral conscience of the world. Sorry, I'm not buying it. I'm not buying it. You know, Meryl Streep, you know, in the Golden Globe is giving this big, you know, speech about women's rights and, and how women are oppressed. The very same woman who is a, an abortion activist. You're speaking about women's rights? Let me tell you about women's rights. There's millions of babies aborted all around the world every year in the name of abortion, in the name of women's rights. And many of them are women. You know, a recent video during the, the referendum, uh, an African lady talking about men know your place, referring to Irish people, all Irish people as racist, and men to know their place. You know, for nearly 30 years, some of my dearest friends have been from Africa, so I knew that she was not the norm. But I felt sad for the way that she reflected, because as I watched, you know, this lady speak, I said to myself, you know what, the KKK could not have done a better recruitment video than this woman. And that's why I call it the Me Too mentality. Because whether it's racism or, or equality, you will invariably find whatever you are looking for. If you're looking for sexism or racism or inequality, you will literally see it everywhere. And even if you don't find it, you will end up creating it. Just like that lady. You see, all of these various ideas, and I'm still dealing with the arena of the mind, because let me say something. As the church, so many times we don't talk about the real stuff that is happening and the real war that is on your mind. And whether you realize it or not, they refer to TV as programming for a reason. There is an agenda to program your mind. There is an agenda to program the way you think. And that's why, you know what, I, I, don't, I refuse to do a 15-minute sermon because these issues are too big. These issues are too big to just gloss over. They need to be dealt with. Amen. You know, all of these various liberal ideologies have simply become a vehicle for promoting Marxism. But instead of the battle being between rich and poor, the battle is now between oppressor and oppressed. And that's why we have victimhood, you know, Olympics, where each person and each group is vying to see who's the most victimized. Let me tell you something about victimization. In this nation, uh, a little over a hundred years ago, a million people starved to death. But we're not victims because we're not living back then. And I can't claim brownie points because of that. we got to get over trying to live in the past. If we insist on living in the past, we will never make any progress as a society. We will just implode. And that's good preaching, whether you like it or not. You see, it's new packaging. But it's the same agenda. The destruction and the subversion of the Western world and the enslavement of its peoples. Matthew 24, 4. Jesus said, watch out that no one deceives you. New living. Jesus said, don't let anyone mislead you. English standard. See that no one leads you astray. One of the characteristics of the end times will be deception. This is why you got to read this book for yourself. You got to know what it says. Don't be taking your information just from the mainstream media. you got to read the Bible and see what it says. Sadly, many people have been taken in by this, even within the church. You know, personally, let me say this. I believe feminism is a trap for hurt and lonely women. As I watched that video... And I say lonely because as I watched that video, I said to myself, what kind of self-respecting man would hang out with an angry woman like that. Angry, aggressive, disrespectful, and a chip on each shoulder. I'm sorry, 
If you've got a chip in, if you've got a chip in your shoulder, you need to deal with it. It's not biblical. Get over it in Jesus' name. That's fine. I'm probably going to trigger some people before the service is out. And you know what? Maybe you need to be triggered. Maybe you need to get rid of that stuff. But I'm just simply saying, Pastor, do you not believe in equality? Well, firstly, <laughs> hey, your pastor loves you. I just get passionate. Firstly, radical feminism at its core doesn't believe in equality. Certainly not between women and men. It teaches men, women to resent and even hate men. And to reject God's order. It teaches that marriage is an oppressive institution. And that all men are predators and oppressors. So let me say as your pastor, that is a lie. For 5,000 years of recorded human history... Men and women have loved each other, have helped each other, and have complimented each other. Yes, God made us equal, but God made us different. And we're living in a generation right now that has decided because of ideology to reject God-given distinctions and differences in the name of equality. And it's unbiblical. You know, ironically, neither do they believe in equality among women. Because as a woman, if you don't have the right opinion, you will be politely told to shut up. We saw that in the recent referendum. Many pro-life women were, you know, put to the side. Yeah, certainly, they don't believe in equality for the unborn. How many women are murdered every year in the womb? And feminists, sorry, I don't hear anything. So, pardon me when I see some of these people making their impassioned speeches and doing nothing to save the unborn. They're not pro-women. They're pro-power. But you may, you may respond by saying, well, pastor, we must, we must respect cultural differences. Uh, many cultures want to have a son first. Well, I like the attitude of the British commissioner. Uh, the, the British uh, chief commissioner of India in the 1800s, Charles Napier, when he was confronted with the tradition of sati, which was this charming local Hindu custom of burning the widow along with her husband on the funeral par. And when he was confronted, he said, when they, when they said, well, it's, it's our custom, he said, be it so. The burning of widows is your custom. Prepare the funeral par. But my nation has also a custom. When men burn women... Alive, we hang them and confiscate all their property. My carpenters shall therefore erect gibbets on which to hang all concerned when the widow is consumed. Let us all act according to our national customs. You see, clearly, not all cultures, our beliefs, our religions are equal. You know, if the West is to have any future, we must come to the place where we acknowledge this. Like we see in the UK where they even have Sharia court courts. You know, where the destiny of a woman is worth half that of a man. So, again, we're rapidly becoming a society that's so polarized that it no longer functions. You know, many men, sadly, are deciding to go their own way. And this is not good news for women. The society we end up will not be any safer. You know, sadly, we will end up in a society where chivalry and honor and respect won't exist. Amen? So again, Genesis 1.27, in the beginning God made them male and female. There is a distinction that is forever recognized by God, forever ordained by God. There is no amount of programming or ideology or, or you know, social justice uh, insanity that can erase the God-given distinctions between male and female. And as I finish, as the worship group comes to the front, when we blame each other, we're just continuing what they did in the Garden of Eden. Adam blamed Eve. Eve blamed the serpent. But ultimately, it got them kicked out of the garden. And, you know, this week, last Wednesday, we uh, commemorated the D-Day landings in Normandy. The 6th of June. You know, the annual D-Day commemoration is a reminder that freedom is not free. Freedom that we enjoy today was purchased at a great price. 
And it wasn't purchased by people who demanded trigger warnings and safe spaces. It was purchased by brave young men who were willing to lay down their lives in the cause of protecting their families and all that they loved. You know, thousands of American men died in Omaha Beach. Many of them never, never even made the beach. They drowned because their, their packs tore them down. And I think it's important for us as a society to remember. Amen? That, you know, this is why we must, we must cherish our freedom. And this is why, you know, all of the leftist movement, whether you're talking about social justice, environmentalism, Antifa, you know, Black Lives Matter, feminism, they all simply bow down to one thing, and that is control. Revelations 13, 8, it says, He causeth all to take a mark on their hand and their head, that no one can buy or sell unless they have the mark of the beast and the number of his name, 666. You might say, John, this is, this is a strange finish to the message. Well, I believe there's a sobriety to the freedom we enjoy. Because right now, there are those who have an agenda to take it away. And that's why maybe my sermons are a little longer. But I'm also, I'm, I'm also conscious of this. The time may come where I don't have the freedom to preach the gospel. Do you know there's nations in the world where you cannot preach the gospel? We, 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 must take, we must show appreciation for the freedom that we have. The Antichrist spirit is one where freedom is taken away. Amen. Our culture needs to change. But I believe it's the church that must lead the way. You know, when we talk about that horrible tradition of sati, of burning the widows. Do you know who led the way? Christian missionaries uh, like William Carey. British Christian missionaries led the way in confronting this practice. They didn't take the attitude, well, you know, we must respect your culture. We must respect your religion. No, they came in there and said, no, that is wrong. There is an objective standard that applies to all people. And they went in there without apology and preached the gospel of Jesus Christ. Repent and believe the gospel. That is our message as the church. And we must come to the place where we recognize that, you know, all of these side issues, that we don't get drawn into them, but that we keep the core thing, the core thing, which is to preach the gospel. Repent and believe the gospel. You must be born again. So if you could stand to your feet today. Oh, Father, I just thank you for your presence here right now in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord, that you love all people. Thank you that you love us enough.